All right, next up in our farm course, still in our fundamental stuff here, but you're going to just love this. This is terminology, and it's really important that you get this stuff figured out. And you don't want to be dragging on to halfway through the course when we're really starting to deal with some cool cases and, and you're still struggling with, with what's sympathetic and parasympathetic and some of these. This is flashcard material. You just make your own flashcards and just learn these terms. Now, there's two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic, everybody knows, is fight or flight. This is the ancient, built-in from the beginning of time, sort of nervous system that let us either stand up and fight the tiger that was about to eat us when we were cavemen or to run away. Take your pick. Either way, it's a caveman thing, fight or flight. It is the adrenergic system, adrenaline the adrenergic system. But then that's one nervous system and that needs to be balanced out so that we can have some homeostasis, we can have some, some balance. And the parasympathetic nervous system brings you back down and lets you rest and digest and, and reset. If we were in sympathetic mode all the time, uh, then that wouldn't be good, uh, and, but then neither would parasympathetic. So they are a balance. They work in opposition to each other. Um, as needed based on what's going on with us. So sympathetic is the adrenergic system. Parasympathetic is the cholinergic system. That has to do with the neurotransmitter that uh, primarily acts in that system. So we have adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and we have acetylcholine. And so who cares about that right now? I just need you to know sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. The other name for sympathetic is the adrenergic system. The other name for parasympathetic is the cholinergic system. There's some flashcards right there. Next up, next set of terms. An agonist activates a receptor, causes something to happen, whereas an antagonist blocks that receptor or inhibits the action. So if we have a sympathetic agonist, Something is called a sympathetic agonist. When that medication or that substance hits the receptor, it causes sympathetic nervous system activation. And then the opposite would be the case in an antagonist. Here's some examples. And we try to use examples that are concrete and that they come from field EMS world. A parasympathetic antagonist is going to block the rest and digest system. If you think of rest and digest as the brakes on a car, then this releases the brakes. It doesn't do anything with the gas. Parasympathetic antagonist releases the brakes, blocks the brakes. Atropine is an example of that. Atropine blocks the parasympathetic system that would be slowing the heart rate. Because it's blocking something that slows heart rate, it ends up increasing heart rate. So it sounds like we're talking in circles here, and it's important to be precise with this. That's why I'm going slower than I have in other videos. I'm going slow, and I'm trying to be precise with this and avoid misspeaking. And there, here's another couple, probably three more flashcards that can come to this point. <clears throat> what about a sympathetic agonist? An example of that is epinephrine, adrenaline comes from your adrenal glands. That's the same thing as epinephrine that paramedics can inject into people. Epinephrine is a sympathetic agonist, which means it activates the sympathetic response. So when you needed to flee or fight, you would need increased heart rate, you would need increased stroke volume from your left ventricle, and you would need your cardiac conduction system to work at high speed. So epinephrine gets you ready to fight. It's a sympathetic agonist, causes the sympathetic nervous system to be activated. So you get an increase in heart rate, increase in stroke volume, increased speed of conductivity, and we'll replace those with, with terms that mean the same thing later because, you know, we can't keep it simple. We have to keep adding on terms. Again, the big disclaimer, I didn't make this stuff up. I just have to teach it to you, so um, don't blame me. <clears throat> Sympathetic antagonist, what would that be? Well, out in the world, lots of patients take a medicine called a beta blocker. 
most paramedic toolboxes have a beta blocker in them. The most common beta blocker out there is called labetalol. Labetalol ends in LOL. It makes it a beta blocker. There's something to tattoo on your arm for a while. Labetalol, beta blocker, is a sympathetic antagonist. So it blocks the sympathetic system. If the sympathetic system was going to cause an increase in heart rate, an increase in stroke volume, and an increase in conduction speed, a sympathetic antagonist would block that. <coughs> Excuse me. Then there's the word sympathomimetic. That's a pretty good Scrabble word, but what's it mean? Sympathomimetic. Well, you can almost see mimic in that word, and that may help you uh, remember. It was, you can definitely see symp sympathetic. So it mimics the sympathetic system. It mimics action of a sympathetic agonist. An example would be Coke or meth or Sudafed. They are sympathomimetics. They would cause an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so let's move on because I'm sure you're not confused enough yet. So we're going to have to finish this up with more confusion. There's alpha and beta. <clears throat> and so an alpha receptor or a beta-1 receptor or a beta-2 receptor. These are all important to us. If you were to activate an alpha-1 receptor, it would cause vasoconstriction. There are receptors on blood vessels that when they are um, activated by an alpha agonist, you have alpha receptor activation that causes vasoconstriction. You can probably guess what an alpha blocker would do. It would prevent vasoconstriction. There are beta-1 receptors and beta-2 receptors. The quick and easy way to remember this is beta-1 works on the heart because you have one heart. Beta-2 works on the lungs. You have two lungs. One heart, two lungs. Beta-1, beta-2. Beta-1 receptor activation causes an increase in heart rate, an increase in strength of contraction, and an increase in speed of the conduction of the impulses in the cardiac conduction system. So beta-1 is very much sympathetic nervous system feeling. It's beta-1 receptor activation. Beta-2 receptor causes bronchial dilation, <clears throat> which apparently I need right now. Bronchial dilation, beta-2 receptor activation, causes your bronchioles to dilate. So when you put beta-1 and beta-2 together, they work pretty good if you're going to fight something or run away from that fight because you would want your heart to beat faster and stronger and you would want to have maximum conduction in your cardiac conduction system and you would want your bronchioles to open up so you can take in more air. So beta-1 and beta-2, heart, one heart, two lungs, flashcard stuff, learn it, live it, love it. <clears throat> now we get to talk about the tropes. Not trops, tropes. Different deal. Chronotrope affects heart rate. We might have a positive chronotrope that would increase the heart rate or a negative chronotrope that would decrease the heart rate. So we're going to end up describing medications and their actions in these sorts of terms. Beta-1, alpha-1, positive chronotrope, positive inotrope, those sorts of things. Chronotrope affects rate. Think of <clears throat> chronotrope and time. So in chronological order, things are in chronological order, they're in order of time, and so a chronotrope affects time, affects rate. An inotrope will affect the contraction strength. The ventricles will contract harder when a positive inotrope is in place, or a negative inotrope would decrease the contraction strength in the ventricles. And then dromotrope is about speed of conduction of the impulse in the cardiac conduction system. So a positive dromotrope is going to speed up the conduction of impulses through the cardiac conduction system, whereas a negative dromotrope would slow it down. So we can now use these terms <clears throat> in some further examples. A positive chronotrope increases the heart rate. Negative chronotrope decreases the heart rate. Positive inotrope increases strength of contraction. Epinephrine is an example of a positive chronotrope and a positive inotrope and, oh, and a positive dromotrope. Epi is positive for all those things. It's going to bump your rate, bump the strength of contraction, and bump the speed of the conduction in the cardiac conduction system. So epi 
adrenaline, epi, cranks up the speed is a sympathetic agonist. It's a beta-1 and beta-2 and alpha-1 agonist. And um, it has these, these effects, positive chronotrope, homotrope, dromotrope. So now we're putting it all together. <clears throat> Again, a beta-1 agonist, positive chronotrope, positive ionotrope, positive dromotrope. Example will be epinephrine. You'll start seeing these in the med cards if you've already looked ahead. Uh, you've seen these terms, and we really need to be good at these terms. Hey, what if we wanted to keep a patient's heart rate from going up and the strength of their contraction from going up? We wanted to keep those two things from happening to help regulate their blood pressure. We might put them on a beta blocker, a beta-1 antagonist, something that ends in LOL, like labetalol or atenolol or metoprolol or propanolol. Things that end in LOL, beta blockers, beta-1 antagonist. It's a negative chronotrope, keeps their rate under control, kind of like governs their heart rate. If you think of a governor on an engine, um, on, on a fire truck or an ambulance, a governor. Not cruise control, different deal. Governor keeps you from going faster than a certain amount. Beta-1 antagonists are negative chronotropes. They keep your rate from going over a certain, a certain rate, which is great for blood pressure works really good, but sometimes you need your heart rate up to maybe deal with some loss in volume and to compensate for that loss in volume and keep your pressure from dropping. So that beta blocker is great on a daily basis. Keeps you from having a heart attack and a stroke, but when you get in trauma, it kind of works against you. It's a recurring theme we'll talk about throughout this thing. So, put it together now. It should go the other way. Um, now I'm going here. A sympathetic agonist would have positive beta-1 effects, and beta-1 effects are positive chronotropy, positive inotropy, positive chronotropy. And so you can probably now you're probably up you're probably up to maybe 15 or 20 uh, flashcards now just trying to put all this stuff together. Well, here's an example: atropine, parasympathetic antagonist. Okay, so let's break that down. Parasympathetic, that's the brakes. That's rest and digest. That would lower heart rate, would be a negative chronotrope. But we're going to have a parasympathetic antagonist. Now we're going to block that lowering of the heart rate. We're going to block the brakes, which would cause a positive chronotropic effect. It would cause the rate to increase. So <clears throat> we say the same thing with a number of different ways, and this terminology stuff gets to be kind of confusing. And for the future here, for 2016 and beyond, we really want to get this stuff down. We want to get this stuff down quick. I don't want to be in the final sessions of the course again and have people still struggling with this stuff. So we're going to make it really pretty much mandatory. Uh, we're going to really kind of emphasize this in the first quarter. And um, this is just an effort thing. This is not beyond anybody from an IQ standpoint. This is just effort. Everybody can learn this stuff. The question is, will you or won't you? And if you won't, then I don't think we can go into deeper material if we have an unstable foundation. So very, very simple stuff. Um, and unfortunately, we call things by different names. So remember, we talked about the sympathetic system is the adrenergic system, and the parasympathetic is the cholinergic system. So a parasympathetic antagonist would be an anticholinergic. Mm, yeah, so we're just needing to work on this, and I want to emphasize again, make your own flashcards. There's tons of flashcards available online. You can get them from some former student. You can get them from some nurse. But what you really need to do is make your own because your brain learns while you're making them, making your own flashcards. And everybody ought to have a set, and you can have them, any, you can have them electronically. You can have them on little index cards. You can do it however you want to do it, but you just got to do it.